Today, we're talking about the growing Black Mirror-esque problem of streamers being tortured for profit, part of China's imploding while another part's lashing out, we've got a growing health crisis that no one's talking about, according to science, everything's just too dang loud, we're gonna talk about all that and so much more on today's brand new extra-large Philip DeFranco show, you daily dive into the news, so buckle up, hit that like button to let me know you like these big shows, and let's just jump into it. Starting with, there are only three places in this world where, according to the house rules, you can actually torture people for fun and or money. A Saudi embassy, but you need MBS's approval, the annual Nest Tickling Convention, and a Twitch subathon. And today, we're talking about the subathons, because this latest subathon torture is the Three Days in a Dark Closet Challenge, which sounds pretty self-explanatory, but then gets even more off the rails. Because right, recently, there was a streamer by the name of Irby who told his mod that if he could finish the challenge, he'd buy him a free car. And there, after just 24 hours, the mod gave up, but that is not where this ends. Because then another streamer who's a friend of Irby decided to take a crack at the challenge. But there, instead of getting a new car if he won, he agreed to demolish his car that he already owns if he lost. And so yesterday, he squeezed himself into a narrow closet with barely enough room for him to stretch out. But I guess because putting yourself in pitch black solitary confinement is not entertaining enough, you could also essentially torture this man for just a quarter. And for just 25 cents, his chat could flashbang him with a blinding white light and ear piercing sound. <laughs> And on top of that, they could pay to torture him with text-to-speech, blast him with a leaf blower, pelt him with eggs or ping-pong balls. And during this, he never really got a rest or a break. It was just endless torture, with it all culminating to the around 25-hour mark where he just couldn't take it anymore, and he gave up with him crying in front of his stream. And so understandably, you have a lot of people saying, what the fuck? I'm also one of them. Because in no world should any of this be normalized. Because also, like, this isn't new. I've seen stuff like this before on TikTok in the past. And in no world should these public platforms be platforming people subjecting themselves to abuse for money. Like, we're living in another Black Mirror episode here. Like, is this where entertainment's at? This makes the NPC streamer thing on TikTok seem so normal. We got people LARPing CIA black site torture for 25 cents a pop. Like, there were even people watching this happen and they were like, he needs to stop, he's having a panic attack. And the truly unfortunate thing is there are a lot of people out there and even outlets that are talking about this as if it's not completely unhinged. We're talking about this like, oh, he failed the challenge and other people are like, oh, I could do it. And unless the platforms actually do something about it, other people are gonna follow because, I mean, look how much free press this guy's getting. Like, y'all, I don't wanna get a real job either, but there's gotta be some lines in the sand. But hey, that is this ridiculous situation and news story, some of my opinion, and now I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? And then, state of Alabama wants to kill people in a fun new way. Specifically, they want to execute a death row inmate by having him breathe pure nitrogen, with the state's attorney general filing documents asking the Alabama Supreme Court to set an execution of a man who was convicted for the 1988 murder for hire killing of a preacher's wife. Now, notably there, Alabama previously tried to execute the same guy last year by lethal injection, but they ultimately didn't do it because of issues getting an IV into his veins. And so now in their new filing, the AG's office says, let's do nitrogen hypoxia, which is when an inmate would be forced to breathe in pure nitrogen, cutting off their oxygen and ultimately causing them to die. And while Alabama is actually one of three states that have authorized this execution method, it's never been used. Though supporters of the method have argued that it's supposed to be painless. And actually, a number of death row inmates, including the one at the center of this story, have sought to block their previous lethal injections by saying they would prefer to be executed by nitrogen hypoxia. But on the other side of this, you have many opponents arguing this basically amounts to human experimentation. But Here's the deal. Given the fact that Alabama has already officially signaled that it is ready to go ahead with this execution method, it's all but ensured to set off lengthy legal battles, which arguably could have been the inmate's intent all along, but it could very well change how he and future death row inmates are killed in the future. But for now, like this inmate, we're gonna have to wait to see how things play out, though arguably the stakes are lower for us. And then you've got this massive growing health crisis in America, but not enough people are talking about it, right? Because you have temperatures all over the country hitting record highs this summer, and now you have kids heading back to school in still sweltering conditions. But here's a huge thing. Tons of schools nationwide lack proper cooling systems or don't even have any air conditioning at all. In fact, a federal report from 2020 estimated that out of 100,000 K-12 public schools in America, around 36,000 of them need updated heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. We're talking about more than a third of all public schools. And the situation has only been getting worse with climate change. For example, a 2021 study found that 13,700 public schools that didn't need cooling systems in 1970 will need them by 2025. Because public schools built before or during the 70s weren't designed for historic historic extreme heat. And understand, this isn't a problem just in typically hot parts of the country. In fact, experts say that one of the major issues here is that schools in cool weather climates are now the most ill-prepared. I mean, some of these buildings we're talking about were specifically built to retain heat, which is why you have education leaders and experts warning that failing to modernize these systems actively harms staff and students and even put them in danger. Or we've seen schools reporting serious heat-related illnesses like heat stroke on hot days, and multiple public health studies finding that as the prevalence of high temperatures increase, so will heat-related illness at school. But the impact of inadequate heating systems extends beyond just the infrastructure 
infrastructure and school buildings. Right, for example, on the very first day of the school year in Des Moines, Iowa, temperatures hit a record 100 degrees. But just five of the 130 school buses in the district actually have AC, which made not only for just an absolutely horrible ride for tons of kids, but also resulted in 15 drivers being treated for signs of heat exhaustion. But also beyond that, the lack of proper cooling undermines the entire point of school. It's incredibly disruptive to learning, and that's actually backed up by science. With a series of studies finding that extreme temperatures increase absenteeism and student disciplinary referrals. You also have students scoring increasingly lower on standardized tests for each day when the temperature was above 80 degrees. And you even have a Harvard research paper from a few years back identifying a direct correlation between rising temperatures and decreased learning outcomes in schools without air conditioning. Right? Researchers finding that when a school is just one degree hotter, it reduces learning over that entire year by 1%. And that notably also disproportionately impacting black, Hispanic, and low-income students. With a paper estimating that heat accounted for as much as 13% of the racial achievement gap in America. And I'm talking about this now because we're just a few weeks into the new school year and we're already seeing firsthand evidence of these heat-related disruptions. Right last week, we saw numerous school districts across the country being forced to modify their schedules because of lacking or non-existent cooling systems. The districts in Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, and so many others either closing down entirely or dismissing students early as millions of people were under excessive heat warnings. So clearly, this is an incredibly serious problem that is only getting worse, but there's not enough movement to actually fix it right now. And part of the reason for that is this problem is so widespread and addressing it is insanely expensive. The 2021 infrastructure bill set aside half a billion dollars to close the funding gap. But experts estimate that $38 billion is what's actually needed. Though in some places, funding isn't even the issue. For example, you have things like one teacher in Philly telling reporters that a school actually bought air conditioners a few years ago. But then the district told them, hey, you can't use that because those units are going to put too much strain on the grid. So they're just sitting in storage unused as you have kids suffering. And honestly, this shouldn't be a surprise because when infrastructure is not addressed, it does what it does. It slowly crumbles, right? You slowly catch up to that can you kick down the road. And I genuinely don't know if we're going to see actual solutions come from our government. And then longtime viewers note that I talk about my Vessies all the time. And it's because I love these go-to for anything shoes. So thank you to Vessi for being a great partner and sponsor of the PDS. And there are so many great styles and colors to choose from, but of equal importance, they're lightweight, waterproof, and snowproof. So you can enjoy a relaxing walk in any weather. I personally like the laceless look at the moment. That's why I'm still reaching for my boardwalks so to move around without being restricted. And Vessi sneakers just look good. The low cut goes with almost any fit that you can think of. And with different colorways, you can pick the right look for yourself. But I also really want to give a shout out to the team at Vessi helping to support programs to create fresh water where it's needed most around the world. But the main thing, go check out Vessi. They have a style for everyone and you'll get 15% off your entire order when you go to Vessi.com slash PDS. That's Vessi.com slash PDS for 15% off right now. And then when you think of 3M, what comes to mind? For me personally, I think of either like picture hanging strips or like masks, but they are an absolutely massive conglomerate with their fingers in everything. And they've actually been on the receiving end of hundreds of thousands of lawsuits by military veterans over their earplugs, which those vets said failed to protect them from hearing loss during their military service. Now the cases date back to 2016 with a whistleblower lawsuit filed on behalf of the U.S. government, and it is one of the biggest mass torts in history, meaning that it is one of the largest groups of people who were all harmed by the same thing. Are these plaintiffs saying the earplugs were faulty and many were left with hearing loss and tinnitus? And all of it leading to the big news today, a $6 billion settlement. And the plaintiff's attorney is saying in a statement, this historic agreement represents a tremendous victory for the thousands of men and women who bravely served our country and returned home with life-altering hearing injuries. Though, of course, because we are talking about a rich-as-fuck company, the company agreed to the settlement without any admission of liability. Instead, saying their earplugs are, quote, safe and effective when used properly, and going on to say they are prepared to go to court if certain terms in the settlement aren't met. However, we'll also see what happens because some analysts suggest that the litigation could cost the company between 10 and $15 billion. And notably, this isn't even the only multi-billion dollar legal settlement 3M has dealt with this year, with them back in June agreeing to pay over $10 billion over 13 years to fund the detection of forever chemicals in drinking water, with the plaintiffs in that case alleging that the company knew the chemicals in its products could cause a variety of health problems along with cancer, low fertility, and birth defects. But also, like with the earplug case, the company didn't have to admit liability in their settlement there either. Also, oddly, this is only the first of two noise-related stories today. And then, do you think that we should ban cashless businesses? Because right now, LA wants to ban them. Because many places in LA have actually stopped accepting cash as a payment method. With a number of business owners saying it's just a more effective and safe way of doing business. Because they say that by accepting just plastic and digital payments, businesses can remove cash-related costs. Things like storage and transport, as well as attempting to minimize the risks of break-ins by limiting the amount of cash that they have on hand. However, according to people like City Council Member Heather Hutt of the 10th District, this practice is leaving many customers behind. In a recent motion to ban cashless businesses reading, not accepting cash payment in the marketplace systematically excludes segments of the population that are largely low-income people of color. With Hutt also going on to say that customers who are unbanked, elderly, or low-income often rely on cash just to get by, and saying in order to ensure that all city residents, including those who lack access to other forms of payment, are able to participate in the city's economic life, we should adopt an ordinance that allows them to pay cash for goods and many services. And as far as how many people does this actually affect, a 2021 study estimated that 7% of California's population was unbanked, with nearly another 20% being underbanked.
category, meaning they have irregular access to banking services. Very notably with this, LA wouldn't be the first to ban cashless businesses. With New York City, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and DC having all adopted similar ordinances and rules. Hell, even whole states like Massachusetts, Colorado, New Jersey, and Rhode Island have banned cashless businesses. But on the other side of this, you have people saying, why penalize a business for running it how they want to? But if a private business is in a utility or an essential service, why does the government have to crack down on them? But for now, we'll have to wait to see what LA does. And in the meantime, I gotta ask you, do you think that we should ban cashless businesses? Yes or no? Why? Why not? And then Starfield has become one of the most anticipated video games in history. And so, of course, it has been surrounded by controversy and craziness. Starting with the fact that there's now leaked footage online that shows that a lot of the stuff that was promised doesn't appear to be there. With that leaked footage coming from a variety of sources, but possibly the dumbest one being from a guy who stole 67 copies of the game and recorded 45 minutes of it. And all of that landing him with some fun felony charges. Also, the specific details around that are kind of hilarious. Because right? he not only stole them from a Memphis, Tennessee distributor, but he also sold copies on this site and then videoed himself shipping them out. Y'all, what is the number one rule about committing crimes? One, don't do it. But two, if you do, don't videotape it. But as ridiculous as all that was, the big controversy now surrounds all the leaks that people are talking about. Because for the fans of the game, the belief that the developers lied is the biggest story. Right? I mean, you had one fan asking the developers, um, when I land on a planet, will I be able to explore the whole entire planet? And the response was a clear, yep, if you want, walk on, brave explorer. And so that, among many past promises, made players feel like it would be a seamless experience. But in one leaked video that I'm not going to show here, because I'm not fighting Bethesda on a copyright strike, it shows that a player eventually hits an invisible wall and is stopped. So you had a lot of fans that were pissed off, but also a number of fans feeling like people are overreacting, right? A lot of people with legit early access to the game for reviews are posting vague messages stating that the leaks don't tell the whole story, with that leading to a lot of speculation that there are load screens or the worlds are set up in massive tiles, right? Things like you can see one area and then do a quick jump in your spaceship to the next tile of the world. But even those vague responses led Bethesda to remind reviewers that they need to keep quiet until the embargo is lifted. And with that, there are also people pointing out that even if there are some invisible walls, that's a minor problem. With the leaked footage appearing to show that it takes 40 minutes to reach the edge. And if you compare that to Fallout 4, their last popular title, it took 35 minutes to go across the entire playing space. So just based off of that, Starfield's already orders of magnitude bigger. But hey, as far as the reality of the situation is, personally, I'm waiting. You know, it's one of the reasons, nine times out of 10, I'm not pre-ordering games, I'm waiting for reviews. But for my beautiful bastards out there who are gamers, I gotta know, what are your thoughts here? And then, the Chinese real estate market is taking a fucking beating right now. Especially as Evergrande stock plummeted as much as 87% yesterday. Which if you're unfamiliar with them, we've talked about them a few times on the show, but they are one of the largest developers in China, if not the world. And notably, when that drop happened, it was the first day that it was allowed to be traded in 17 months. And so it really wasn't surprising to see a drop like this, especially since last month, Evergrande posted that between 2021 and 2022, it had a net loss of $113 billion. And it topped that shit Sunday with a very little cherry on top of roughly a $5 billion loss so far this year. And a really important thing to understand is that Evergrande's issues translate to more than just large creditors getting screwed. It also means that the company's having trouble raising cash that it could then use to finish its many, many unfinished projects. With China facing a major housing crunch in many parts of the country, these vacant, unfinished buildings not only mean fewer potential homes, but also more expensive projects if other developers want to either attempt to take them over or just start from scratch. But there is a small glimmer of hope for the company. It's a restructuring plan, right? Because bondholders have four more weeks to look over these latest numbers and consider it. And I don't want us to get lost in the weeds into the specifics of the different types of bondholders, but they seem to be kind of split. One group overwhelmingly supports the plan, while a different group is much less on board. And until that's decided, the Chinese real estate market, which is a massive sector of its economy alongside the construction industry that it intersects with, is in major trouble. And with how interconnected those pieces are to the global economy, any collapse will likely have a domino effect, which to kind of give you an idea of what that would look like, you look back to 2008. And then, ah, sleep, it is quite possibly the best thing ever, but only when you actually get it. You know, being busy with work, kids, life's typical stressors, you know, I don't always sleep well. And that's even when we do get to bed on time, but that is where today's fantastic sponsor comes in, Beam. Right by now, you've heard me talk about Beam's delicious hot cocoa with five natural ingredients that put me right to sleep and helps me wake up feeling amazing. And not only is it delicious, it contains five powerful natural sleep promoting ingredients like nano hemp, reishi mushroom extract, magnesium, L-theanine, and melatonin. It's third party lab tested, contains no THC, and is trusted by top athletes to help them get their best sleep and recovery. And with fall around the corner, you you'll love the pumpkin spice dream powder, which you should snag because it's only here for a limited time. So if you find your sleep hygiene to be lacking, Beam's dream powder is for you. Just go to shopbeam.com slash DeFranco and use code DeFranco to save up to 35% off the original price and a free frother. I am hooked and I know you'll be too. So shopbeam.com slash DeFranco and use code DeFranco to let them know we sent you. And then noise in America isn't just a nuisance. It's actually making our lives worse. And this is incredibly true if you live in or around mid to large sized American cities. I mean, your eardrums are being endlessly assaulted 
blasted by. People blasting music, cars, trucks, buses revving their engines, planes taking off and landing, trains screeching down the tracks, helicopters buzzing overhead, emergency vehicles like cop cars, fire trucks, and ambulances, there's sirens wailing. I mean, there's a lot of noise polluting our everyday lives. I mean, we've got concerts so loud, people nearby think it's an earthquake. But we talked recently about Taylor Swift and Travis Scott, but Harry Styles did the same thing at Madison Square Garden back in 2021, with people at a boxing match in the theater below his concert showing videos of the ceiling shaking and comparing it to an earthquake. But here is the very important thing. While our world has gotten louder and louder over the years, we are still working with the same old ears that were designed to perk up at the snap of a twig, right, the sound of an animal. So it's not surprising that a researcher at the University of Michigan who looked at the data from the noise detector feature on people's Apple watches said the preliminary results suggest that potentially as many as one in three Americans are exposed to levels of sound that might be harmful to their health. Right, because we each have these delicate microscopic hairs in our inner ear that pick up vibrating frequencies from the eardrum that then relay sound to the brain. But if those vibrations are too strong, they can stress or even break those hairs and the damage is irreversible, which is how we lose our hearing or suffer tinnitus. Now, notably, the human ear can tolerate up to about 85 decibels or roughly the sound of city traffic before that happens. But noise isn't just something that you hear, it's something that you feel. Right? Even noise as low as 45 decibels can trigger an involuntary stress response, raising your blood pressure and heart rate and releasing stress hormones. So actually, if you are exposed to chronic noise pollution, you're liable to fall into a chronic state of stress. And that also means all the horrible, terrible, no good things that come along with it. Things like heart disease, hypertension, stroke, cardiac arrest, anxiety, depression, even an increased risk of premature death. In fact, researchers found that people who live in areas with high levels of transportation noise were more likely, among other effects, to suffer major cardiac events within five years. And this persisting even when they controlled for other environmental and behavioral factors that could contribute to poor cardiac health. And then, as it turns out, when the sun goes down, noise becomes extra dangerous because it disturbs sleep. And notably, that's even when the person doesn't remember being woken up. And so that same study tied higher levels of aircraft noise exposure to heart-related nighttime deaths less than two hours after the noise, which is why the World Health Organization recommends no more than 40 decibels of nighttime noise outside bedrooms and 30 decibels inside bedrooms to prevent health effects and ensure high-quality sleep. But nearly a third of the U.S. lives in areas exposed to noise levels of at least 45 decibels. And the thing is, that's probably an underestimate because that's from the Department of Transportation analysis that they did in 2020, which was a time when the country was generally quieter because we were dealing with lockdown. And something the data also exposes is just like pretty much every other bad thing in the universe, it's disproportionately affecting poor, black, and brown people. And that's largely because historically they've been near stuff like waste dumps, industry, and airports. Policymakers have failed to protect them from noise pollution the way wealthier neighborhoods have been cocooned from. But then, digging even further, we find that loud noise especially impacts children. With studies showing it can actually stunt a child's cognitive development, especially for language-based skills like reading. With a neurobiologist telling NPR, young children's brains are craving sound-to-meaning connections. So it's very important that the sounds around them be nourishing and meaningful. And the outlet explaining when their environment is quiet enough for them to pay attention to sounds that are important or particularly interesting to them, it is a powerful teaching tool. But when their environment is constantly polluted by meaningless noise, they get distracted and their ability to concentrate suffers. And we've actually known this as far back as 1975, because that's when researchers studied a New York public school where one side of the building sat right next to extremely loud train tracks. And they compared the students on either side of the building and found that those on the noisier side performed worse. And so what did they do? The school soundproofed those classrooms and the transit authority cushioned the tracks with rubber pads. And boom, like that, a year later, the students' reading scores jumped as much as a full grade level. And so now you actually see some schools like this one in D.C. experimenting with different ways to make the classroom quieter. With everyone using intermittent sign language, students wearing special classroom shoes made of cloth and soft rubber soles. But it's also not just the children who can benefit from a little more silence. Right? Your adult brain also has to work extra hard to sift through all the noise to find the sounds that you're looking for. And that can genuinely be physically exhausting. With some people who are hard of hearing describing the experience of listening fatigue. And in today's technologically saturated age, even when you're sitting at home insulated from outside noise, you're still constantly being bombarded by noisy devices. Right? You got your TV, your computer, your phone, your washing machine, dishwasher, air conditioner, anything that fucking beeps and boops. And understand, none of this is to say that all noise is bad or that we should strive for absolute silence everywhere. Right? Whether we're talking about generally or how research has shown that certain meaningful sounds like musical instruments and singing can actually build and strengthen neural connections. Plus, noise is a big part of life of a community and some would argue that it's worth the risk. But also, there's a difference between that and some fucker that's revving his engine so loud to make up for his small dick. Also, from a pure research standpoint, it can be a great tool because when noise pollution is high, that's usually a good indicator that air and water pollution may be as well. And in fact, noise pollution also fucks with the ecosystem. Right? Birds and in particular marine animals like whales and dolphins use sound to communicate and echolocate. So when, for example, a super tanker cargo vessel moves through the ocean, it produces sound reaching 200 decibels. And so for all the marine life there, that's absolutely fucking insane. But here's the thing. You don't have to just be a perpetual victim. Right? There's a few things you can do. Like, first off, just get some earplugs. But maybe not from 3M. They're cheap. They're effective. It's not necessarily the most convenient thing in the world, but it's definitely more cost effective than like soundproofing your entire home. But you can do that. Also, I will say here, it doesn't mean covering your walls and like those foam panels that you see in recording studios. Rather, you can do things like install carpeting, put up heavy curtains and tapestries or place furniture along the walls where most of the noise is coming through. But also, I will note there,
there that some anti-noise advocates argue those are individual private fixes. While helpful to you if you can afford it, it's not for everybody. Which is why you have people pushing for public solutions that often target one of the worst noise offenders, transportation. And so they advocate for things like making it easier to walk or bike, creating electric buses, reducing speed limits, disincentivizing trucks, and cracking down on illegal vehicle modifications. They could also make more buildings with triple pane windows and thicker insulation, especially for bars and nightclubs that blast music all night. Part of the reason I'm focusing on the United States here isn't just because that's the majority of this audience. As a number of people rightly point out, other countries already do a lot of this. Locks on freight trains, noise reduction in car manufacturing, and mitigation efforts at airports. In Paris, they even have cameras that monitor the noise emissions from vehicles and fine drivers who exceed set limits. In Germany, they prohibit people from mowing their lawns on Sunday because it's supposed to be a day of rest. And in Switzerland, they actually have national quiet hours not only on Sundays, but also every day overnight and one midday hour on weekdays. And so you might be asking, well, why don't Americans do the same? Like, not all of those things, but some. Well, the answer is, we actually already tried to. Right, in 1972, Congress passed the Noise Control Act, and the EPA created safety limits, educated the public about dangers, and conducted studies on noise pollution. But then when Reagan entered the White House, he defunded the agency's Office of Noise Abatement, which made it much harder to enforce regulation. Though notably, in June of this year, a member of the House introduced a measure to refund that office, signaling that anti-noise activism is actually getting the government's attention. And that same month, a New York City council member introduced legislation that would require emergency vehicles to use low-frequency sirens, which would actually be huge because New York is one of the loudest cities in America. But with all that said, I now got to pass the questions off to you. I mean, what are your thoughts in general with this story? What have your experiences been with noise pollution where you live? Also, where is that? Any and all thoughts you have, I'd love to hear from you. And then, China is having an absolute meltdown over Japan. Right, Japan released traded water from Fukushima into the ocean with the approval of the IAEA, with many scientists agreeing that it'll have a negligible impact on the environment, with this being a process that'll take 30 years as they slowly release it. But China is acting like Japan unleashed a toxic plague into Asia, with China's wolf warrior artist releasing this image depicting Japan. Right, first, China calling them selfish and irresponsible, and now China says it's blocked all seafood imports from Japan despite all testing of the water and fish, showing it to be very safe, which is why Japan is now taking China to the WTO over the seafood ban. And a key thing here, scientists have pointed out that China actually releases untreated water from its nuclear plants every day that is actually more radioactive than what Japan is releasing. But that still hasn't stopped Chinese citizens from harassing Japanese businesses and schools with phone calls and throwing rocks at their embassy in China. So you've got Japan asking China to tell its citizens to chill the fuck out, China saying it has no idea what Japan's talking about. And as far as Japan's other neighbors, South Korea said that if Japan is following the regulations and doing it safely, then who cares? Taiwan and the Philippines basically said whatever. But in Hong Kong, they declared Japan an enemy of the whole world. And then China has demanded that the British Museum return all of its Chinese cultural relics that it stole. And also adding that the British Museum should return all of their stolen relics to their home country. Or we're talking Egypt, Greece, India, Nigeria, not just China. And they say the vast majority of their 8 million relics are stolen from other countries and that the UK has a bloody, ugly, shameful colonial history. Which damn, like I'm not a fan of the Chinese government, but I don't see the lies here. Like when you go to the British Museum, it's like if a bank robber had their heists on display. Like the British Museum took part of the inside of one of their pyramids and brought it back to London. Imagine construction equipment just showing up at your house one day. They chop that thing in half. They put part of your house in their house for other people to see. And then you ask for it back and they're like, stop being ridiculous. How would that even work? You can come and see it though. And that is where today's daily dive into the news is going to end. But for more news you need to know right now, I got you covered right here. You can click or tap or I'll link in the description down below. And if you're already caught up on everything, do not worry because my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love your faces and I'll see you right back here tomorrow.